Hi guys, it's Eric with the Film Photography Channel and let's take a look at the Minolta Maxim 7000i. Okay, so this is the Minolta Maxim 7000i, also named the Dynax 7000i. Um, this is the first system autofocusing camera that Minolta got right. I say that because the 7000 was the first autofocusing camera that really was much better than the other attempts, uh, the very few other attempts that manufacturers had at creating an autofocus SLR. Uh, Nikon had the F3AF. There's um, other manufacturers that had um, uh, autofocus cameras, but the autofocusing system was built into the lens. This camera had 31 lenses actually available to it um, using the autofocusing motor in the body, which was adopted by Nikon and, and several other manufacturers probably for the next decade before they actually went back to putting the, the autofocus motor in the lens, as you see like an example for the Nikon AFS lenses today. Okay, as you can see, the front element moves there which isn't ideal for polarizers, but other than that, it's it's pretty good for anything else. But yeah, as you turn a polarizing filter, it, it kind of changes the effect. So that's one thing that uh, this may not be ideal for. Uh, let's just look at the body here. Um, this particular Minolta, the 7000i, the, again, the successor to the 7000, which did have the autofocusing that my understanding didn't work that well this autofocusing system in this Minolta uh, works really well. Okay, so, all right, let's just go over the body real quick and then I'll, I'll touch on the rest of the, what we were talking about there. All right, so what you see here on top is your sliding power switch. The first uh, position just turns the camera on and you can hear the, the autofocusing system kicking in right away. The second uh, setting is if you want the camera to beep when it autofocuses that beep that we're all used to hearing nowadays. This is probably the first camera that had that. Uh, the function setting here corresponds with the these settings right here. Okay, these four settings are your uh, exposure compensation. And let's show you how that works. What you do first is you go, you select one of these. For example, you select exposure comp there. See, you it rotates to them. And then you hold the function button down and then, and of course it's hard to do holding the camera up like this, but then you make your adjustments with this toggle switch here. You see how it, it's showing you what your exposure comp is. All right, and, and let's leave that here for, for a reason, okay? Uh, let's change it to, uh, let's say the multi-point focusing, or I'm sorry, the single point focusing. This is, It's at multi right now, and that makes it the single point focusing, right? The third function right there is actually gonna be your your uh, continuous uh, shutter exposure, which is only one setting and it maxes out at three frames per second, so you can see like the multiple frames. All right, so you see we made a bunch of changes there uh, on the uh, viewable on the glass there. Well, I tell you what. Let's let's go ahead and put the camera out of autofocus. This toggles your focus. You hear the lens clicking back into the autofocus, uh, and that puts it out of the autofocus mode. It puts it into manual focus. All right. So, okay. So we've got manual focus. We've got multi, uh, you know, continuous uh, frames per second. Uh, we've got the exposure comp adjusted, and we've set the the metering to or the the focusing to a single point. If you hit this P button here, it resets everything. You see how I put the lens back in autofocus and it put all these back to their or default settings. It took away the exposure comp and every, all the adjustments we made. So if you're, you know, in a dynamic situation, you're in a hurry to, you know, just to get your camera going and you made changes to it, uh, you hit that P button and then you're good to go. Or it's kind of a neat, you know, uh, feature uh, that I haven't really seen in any other camera. Okay, moving on. Here's your shutter release, and I mentioned earlier this. This is your the toggle switch that toggles the uh, you know all the the settings that you have here. 
uh, you can actually go on your mode button here and toggle between your program um, and you see how big the P is in program because this is camera that's kind of meant to be used in that program mode program shutter uh, aperture priority and then manual and if you're working with a camera in a, in a manual setting you use this little unmarked button on the side to switch between um, shutter speed and um, aperture settings because th these lenses don't have an aperture ring all right as you see there there's a shutter speed by default if I press in the side button now my uh, apertures start set, uh, changing as you can see that all right um, okay I mentioned the autofocus manual focus switch this is the, the lens release button and these lenses are a little odd I mean they they you know they start pre pretty much where most other lenses finish in terms of where they place the red dot most cameras have the red dot on this side and then you rotate up to the top or something like that this this starts way on the right side there and and locks in uh, not a big deal but the, these are really fine lenses these Minolta lenses are good this particular lens is a 35 to 70 and it's a constant aperture f4 okay so it's not a you know 3.5 to 5.6 or something like that it's an f4 all the way through the zoom range so that's uh that's a really nice feature to have in in uh and kind of unexpected in this type of camera um it does have the data back i'm not going to get into the the data back because it's just not uh they're not uh, they're they're outdated they typically uh, print the date time year or something like that um uh, but th these data backs i believe ended in um 1999 in other words they can't uh, adjust the date beyond a certain year which is already passed it may not be 99 okay um, looking up top here this is just an illumination uh, window here right up top so this uh, this window just lets light into for your um, for your display inside the viewfinder that shows you your shutter speed and your and your aperture beyond that this viewfinder shows you the uh, focus ready light a uh, couple different modes there green means you're good to go and you hear the beep uh, do that okay that just means that you're that you're okay for uh, you know you've got good focus and uh, if it's red and you get an extended beep let's see if I can can't it's and it's hard to get this camera to not focus all right to speak about the focus system on this camera like I, I, I alluded to it earlier this camera has the first uh, practical working usable autofocus system the 7000 had the same or similar autofocus system but it just didn't work as well as this one does this camera focuses pretty much uh, instantaneously it does have a focus light and uh, the flash uh, the focus illumination light there um, it I guess it does use it from time to time but uh, whether it uses it or not it, this camera pretty much focuses instantly I've, I've ne I haven't had an occasion where it didn't catch focus when I wanted it to and that that really s speaks volumes for you know the big deal that are, that's made out of autofocusing even today uh, compared to this camera which is from the 90s um, yeah so focusing just on a blank gray wall and I've checked that versus like a you know much newer cameras I've got a Nikon D5500 which has a decent focusing system I've got a Nikon D810 and I remember my Nikon D500 uh, were not able to focus just on a blank wall, whether it's white or like in here, we've got a gray wall. And see this one, it locks in. Uh, this is just focusing on the white ceiling and it, it locks right in. Focusing on the gray wall, it locks right in. I mean, it did hunt there a little bit, but um, uh, the Nikons would just keep going back and forth back and forth and never lock in and somehow this uh, camera is able to lock in on on features or uh, yeah features that you're taking photos of without any detail in it which I think is a pretty neat uh, trick I'm not sure how that how it works but it does work really well See, this particular one has a nice little ding right here which you know makes it none any uh, no, no worse for the wear but you know a nice little chip taken out of it um, the viewfinder is nice bright clear let's take a look through there it's a good size viewfinder and again you've got uh, the f-stop you've got the shutter speed you've got an indicator that'll let you know if you're under or overexposed 
it also has um, a couple of lights in there for a flash. You got your typical lightning bolt, and then you've got a, like a profile of a flash that kind of reminds you that the flash is charged. Um, and I'm going to get into the flash system because that's a whole other thing. All right. Um, on the bottom, now this camera did not offer any motor drives or any, any add-ons. It is an automatically advancing camera. It uses one of these guys here this weird little battery which which is easy enough to get a hold of this is a 6203 6 volt uh, and it also says 2CR5 and uh, I think it cost uh, about 11 bucks or something like that so it's not terrible and they and they last about 40 rolls so it's so it's you know it's it's not bad all right to open up the back of this beauty here you just uh, pop a little switch on the side you can see that and as you can see it's uh, it's set up for DX coding you know the little old school barcode that you see on the film there you just pop it in it's very easy to load super easy to load and you just put it in uh, you know load the film on this side and then you make sure you extend it out to the to the red dot there and yeah, I guess make sure that it's in the sprocket. You close it, and it does its thing. And as long as it shows you a number one right there, then you know the film is properly loaded. Um, tripod socket where you would expect it to be in line with the lens. And it is a metal threaded tripod socket, not plastic like the rest of this camera. Um, this, These contacts here, I thought initially they were for a motor winder or battery pack or something like that. This is actually for a for a flash system, um, professional flash system that uh, Minolta offered with this camera. And like I said before, this is a system camera. Bunch of lenses, bunch of accessories available for it. I'll I'll probably show some photos throughout the video of that stuff. And beyond that, it's got uh, automatic rewinding, and um, you you can actually make different uh, settings for how you want your camera to function. But for this camera in particular you need one of these. This is the custom function card and I did want to get this, this particular one because it allows you to like uh, set the film rewind so the leader stays out when you go to rewind the film. Uh, and Minolta calls these special application cards. Uh, for example, the sports action card. This card controls the camera's basic settings for taking pictures of fast moving subjects. And th the camera that I've got here actually came with a sports action card. And it, what it does is it, it tries to just use the fastest possible shutter speed that it can. Uh, for any given situation, it'll prioritize for shutter speed. Now, a lot of the stuff that these cards do, any photographer that you know knows their way around a camera and knows how stuff works, they really don't need these. I mean, if you if you want to stop action, you know, if you want to use the fastest shutter speed you can, then you go to shutter priority, and you know, and then that that really do what this camera will or what this card will do for you. The portrait card uh, does the opposite. It'll it'll use the largest uh, aperture opening so you can get the nice out of focus background. Uh, so that's another card. They call it the portrait card. Back here, there's a dedicated spot metering button if you just want to catch that center point uh, and that have that be the only point that's actually metered. Uh, anyway, you get it. So the, the kind of stuff that, that nowadays is pretty common in even cheaper cameras, uh, those like the, the custom function settings, the, the sports mode, the portrait mode, you see that in cameras all over the place, and it's usually like a dial. Uh, another neat little thing, once, you're, once you make the adjustments, you don't have to leave the card in there. That's not true of all the cards, but of the custom function card, it's hard-coded into the, the circuitry of the camera. If, so if I set it to have the film leader stay out, I don't have to continue to... Uh, to keep the card in there. So what you do is you slide the card out here, you eject it, and once you've made your adjustments, you can get rid of the card and put it away. You don't need it. These cards uh, cost a pretty penny. I, I want to say about uh, 50 bucks back in, in the 90s. Um, and they were pretty popular uh, with this uh, camera. Um, so you can buy the camera and 
and continue to upgrade it, you know, for the, all these different functions as time goes by. So Minolta, if you look at the big picture here, Minolta has made this camera, which is a nice, you know, plasticky, shiny camera, which type of camera I usually don't like, but uh, I, I kind of do like this camera a lot. Um, they made this camera, but they also made lenses that you can't get anywhere else. This, this will only work with Minolta uh, system lenses. So they, they kind of made things a little bit proprietary, which is fine. And that's, you know, that's their option. All right. Speaking of proprietary, let's take a look at this weird flash shoe here. If you talk about proprietary, it doesn't get any more proprietary than this. All right, this flash shoe, you won't see on anything else except this Dynex uh, Maxim uh, series of cameras and the Sony A series up to about 2006. They kept this weird flash shoe. This doesn't do anything any differently than any other flash shoe. It does speak with the camera. It's got TTL. It does measure the light, and it does everything that the, the normal flash shoes do. But... Um, you know, Minolta, they wanted their own thing. It's like the beta versus VHS, you know, thing. Who's going to win that, that war there? And it wasn't really much of a war, but here, here's what the flash, here's what the flash shoe looks like from the bottom. It's a little strange. You see the back is closed and the front there is open. And it's a good mounting system, though. It's nothing wrong with it. It's not, it's actually probably a little more solid mounting system. You just slide it on there and it's, it's on there really solid. It doesn't, do a lot of wobbling there's a big button on the side that makes it pretty easy to take the flash right off all right and and this particular flash which is the minolta maxim and everything for the series is named maxim like the lenses or whatnot uh the 5200i the reason i got this one because it's just a little bit nicer it's got a, a screen like you're used to seeing it's uh the lower flash below this one uh, just has uh, buttons or dials or whatever so i like to have the backlit screen um Although this backlit screen is, is you know, barely visible uh, when it is lit, it, the, the light is really, really weak in there. Um, all right, so going back to the how these two work together, uh, the flash is off right now, okay? And there's a little indicator that tells you it's off, right? But as soon as you mount the flash, even though the flash doesn't, well, hold on, the camera's off too. So when you turn the camera on, right? the flash does not come on like uh typically like nikons do but the flash is charging i can hear it charging so when you actually do turn the flash on it's ready to go you see that you've got your flash ready light in there and inside the viewfinder when you half press same thing you've got a slow blinking flash ready light to say hey we're ready to go uh, you also have a flash uh light uh, a red light that's got the like the side view of, of a flash to let you know that the flash is mounted and, and is active and is ready to roll all right so that noise you hear there and you could probably see it in this angle you see how the lens of the flash zooms in zooms in and out right uh, so the flash to zoom with the lens it'll zoom manually or automatically uh, the zoom range there's actually a zoom button on here the zoom range on this flash is from 24 28 35 50 and then i think so well, actually 85 is where it maxes out it's also uh can be used in a manual mode and and can be adjusted uh for the for the strength uh one one to one which is full strength right on down to one half strength quarter eight sixteenth thirty and then down to thirty second is as low as it'll go and it's kind of a little different you can use it um, you can set the, the, the level, the power. Like, for example, I set it from, to one eighth so it doesn't use as much power. And then it lets me know that um, I'm good from 2.3 feet to 16 feet in TTL mode. So it's still automated. And true to form, if you hit the big P, everything's automatic, everything's ready to go. You got no worries. You can just you know shoot away and the flash does what it uh, whatever it needs to do all right and it's uh it's really accurate flash i mean it, it uses it's um you know it, it measures the light really really well it's a ttl system so it uses the, the the metering system in the camera to determine exactly how much light is needed uh fill flash works really really good 
uh, on this particular setup. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's actually a good flash system. It's uh, it's you know it bounces as you can see as you would expect uh, ninety up to a ninety degree bounce and it actually rotates as well. So if you wanna if you're holding your your camera like this, you can still bounce it off the ceiling. Or if you're holding like this and you want to bounce it off of a wall, you know if, if the ceilings are really high or something, or if you just want to get like a side lighting effect, you can do that. Now my uh, litmus test here for uh, for flashes as I like to do yeah and it tends to blank out on the video yeah but I just I just ran about 20 23 frames uh, and it flashed for every single one of them it's amazing to me that these cameras can do that and the so a lot of these modern cameras are, are not able to do that. But anyway, so you see it, it keeps up with the continuous. And that's anywhere from, let me see, that was anywhere from 2.5 feet to like 10 feet or 11 feet actually. So that's a pretty good range uh, if, you're, if you need that continuous flash to, to keep up with you. All right, so let's get rid of this for now. And I'll just show you real quick how uh, you heard the camera re rewind itself automatically. And you see how it did rewind it'll leave the uh the film leader out there all right so this is the the film back you can see the dx um i'm sorry over here the dx uh sensors for the film this is a metal uh vertically traveling shutter so it's all metal this camera will go to one four thousandth of a second that's a, a big reason it needs a metal shutter instead of a cloth one because they're just quicker and the horizontal traveling mechanism makes it easier to get up to that one four thousand speed um all these sensors here are for accessories as you can see this data back only uses two of uh, these many sensors here because um, this is an interchangeable back pretty typical uh, for film backs or cameras you know these system cameras the film back comes right off of there and it's fairly easy to put on you gotta open up the back there to make it easier just to speak a little bit about the design of the camera it, they Minolta did away with the um, the foam that was typically here, like you see in the 70s and 80s era cameras. They have foam to seal the light away. The only foam on this camera is here where the film uh, window is to let you know what kind of film is inserted there. But it's good that they just did like a tongue and groove thing here. So when you close the back, it's well sealed from light. All right, another little trick or a little feature that Minolta came up with here, uh, built into the neck strap, it, you've got a a cover for your for the viewfinder and it's really handy to have it on there just like that right so anytime you need it it's there now more expensive or more sophisticated cameras will have like a little a little switch here and an internal shutter that'll close this off but you know this gets it done just as well and it's obviously a lot cheaper to to make it that way and it may have even been an afterthought i i don't know um how that went all right, so the control center here, uh, I mentioned earlier, this is where you pop your, your cards in. You know, your, your custom function cards will pop right in there. Um, this is the eject button right here for those custom function cards. But you also have your ISO uh, setting here. Uh, you can set it to DX and forget it. Or if you want to uh, use something other than the box speed, then you would make that adjustment here and then use the toggle switch once you opened up the ISO uh, menu. This is to manually rewind the film. This is the card adjustment button. So you just hit that button and then up top on this menu here, the, the card, it'll, it'll allow you to make the different settings on the card. Okay. Um, and the card button up top is to determine or for you to tell the camera, see this button right here is for you to tell the camera if you want to use the settings on that card or not. So if you're using, uh, say, a bracketing card or something like that that you've got inserted in there and you've got it to bracket plus or minus two stops or something like that automatically, but you don't want to do that, you just hit this button and it'll it'll turn the card off. Uh, nice little shoot cover. I'll show you since I'm up close there. It gives it a nice, neat little finished look. Okay, that's just for the to cover up the hot shoe. This camera also has a little this little panel. This is just a socket that you can put like a a remote control. Uh, an interval timer, you know, lots of different little accessories. Because, like I did say, this is a this is a 
pretty nice little system camera. It does have interchangeable focusing screens. I just don't like uh, taking those out because I don't want to get dust in them. And, and I find this screen, especially given that it's an autofocus camera, the screen is great. And that's the only one that I'll ever use probably. So let's talk about the lenses a little bit. This lens is the uh, Minolta Maxim 35-70 f4 constant aperture zoom. It's a nice handy zoom range, you know, 35 to 70 is pretty typical, uh, you know, kit lens or what have you. It's a nice plasticky lens, shiny plastic. Here you have a, a macro switch and pretty straightforward. You just rotate the dial, flip the switch and then continue to turn. Okay. And it locks into the macro range. Another thing that happens when you put this in the macro range is you lose your auto focusing. And I'm talking about this particular lens. I don't know how all the other ones work, but on this particular lens, when you put it in macro, it doesn't auto focus anymore. And it's just as easy to focus with the zoom uh, ring. And it does give you fairly precise focus using the zoom ring. It doesn't, it doesn't focus out to infinity anymore when you're set there, but uh, for macro purposes, it works just fine. And it, it is a nice, uh, nice sharp lens, surprisingly sharp, with a really nice autofocus background. Uh, I was blown away by how nice the bokeh is on this particular lens, when, given that this is one of the first lenses that uh, Minolta ever made that had a plastic element in it. So yeah, this, this fantastic plastic uh, zoom lens, constant aperture f4 zoom lens, has a plastic uh, element in there fused to a glass element but it looks great I mean, in, in Nikon and a lot of manufacturers do that with their kit lenses today it's pretty common practice so while I'm talking about the lenses let me mention to you by the way that these lenses are all the modern Sony A mount okay so that's kind of a bonus right if you're already in the Sony ecosystem and you want to delve into film um, this camera and these dirt dirt cheap lenses can actually fit on your modern Sony camera. While we're talking about lenses, let's talk about the beer can. All right, so what is the beer can? This is affectionately referred to by Minolta and, and Mac, as particularly Maxim enthusiasts as the beer can. And for, I guess for pretty obvious reasons, it's about the size and maybe a little bit heavier than a, than a big beer can. Little zoom, I, I heard it called a little beer can. I don't know how much that really took off. So this is a uh, 70 to 210 lens and it's got a nice metal barrel um, it's got a nice heft to it but it's definitely not too heavy uh, super wide zoom ring as you can see here All right and uh, the lens hood that you saw you can uh, flip it back onto the body given that the Maxim has a nice uh, grip here pretty decent grip and it's full size too it's not like the grips nowadays where your pinky falls off the bottom it's a nice full-size grip it'll it balances the lens really nicely you can see the lens barrel doesn't move back and forth all the zooming action is internal now just like the other one though when you focus you see the, the front element changing around and now you can hear that's what the the unable to attain focus lamp or noise sounds like this lens is super quick to focus this lens actually has a macro setting as well but it's just, uh, you, you just rotate the, the zoom ring and put it in the macro setting. It doesn't have a dedicated button for that. And it does uh, actually continue to autofocus in macro setting. And it will uh, focus down to 1.1 meters, is it? Yeah, 1.1 meters, which is just a little bit over, a little bit over three feet. The beer can is known for a few things. It's known for its, uh, for it being such a nice sharp lens. And the bokeh, again, Again, I'm I'm really getting, you know, I'm really been continuously impressed by how nice the out of focus background is on these, on these lenses and how good they focus. And this one passes the gray wall test as well. So this lens you can focus into a, just a blank wall, and this camera and this cool focusing system just kind of figures out how to do it. But I get a green light, which means that you know once you get the green light, it'll let you take the photo. Um, Oh, and, and speaking of the photo and the exposure system and everything, if you half press this, the shutter button here, you can focus, recompose with no problem at all. Um, I found this, this focusing system to be surprisingly 
uh, quick and surprisingly accurate for something that came out of the, you know, out of this decade, out of the 90s. Um, the compared to you know more modern uh, cameras, even though you know you know even though those modern cameras for some reason can't focus on a blank wall like this one can, they do focus quicker on like moving subjects and and other other type of you know subjects. So don't let me lead you to believe that this is a better focusing camera than something that's out today. You know. Um, from Sony or from Nikon or from Canon because it's not but it is a, a really reliable uh, camera uh, it, it does work really well I guess the point is that you don't feel like you're using anything that's outdated okay this camera does not feel outdated at all it's a nice uh, quick working autofocusing camera that that is very very usable nowadays you know I don't use autofocusing that much myself but if I if I want it and I and I actually found it handy not too long ago you know, out taking pictures of the kids that are running around. We went to go see the cherry blossoms in, in Washington, D.C. And it, I used this particular lens, and it worked really well. The other lens we'll take a look at is the Nifty 50. So this is the Minolta Maxim 50mm uh, f1.7. Let me show you the, the rare lens caps on these cameras. It's a little unique. All right. Now you see they have a little index point right there. Just kind of let you know where to where to line it up. Uh, but look what happens if you can see it here. I'll try to get it. You see that when I take it off, the aperture closes down and it's ready to be mounted on the camera. But the 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 thing is, when you put it on, it opens the aperture completely up and it, the lens is stored that way. I think that is absolutely brilliant. Okay, for Minolta to, to take something as basic and as simple as a rare lens cap and make a thing out of it where it actually will open up your lenses, your, your aperture blades, to keep oil or to keep them from sticking to each other. Because if, if you don't use this lens, I don't know, for a year, two years, five years, whatever, and the blades are closed, the blades might be just a little sticky. Okay, they may, you know, best case and worst case, so they could actually seize, uh, you know, especially if they're subject to, to hot and cold temperatures or, or humidity or what whatnot. When you have the aperture blades completely open, then that's not a that's not an issue at all. And I think that's just brilliant that they came up with that. Minolta had, did a lot of smart things with their with their cameras in general that um, uh, that was copied by other manufacturers to include the autofocusing system. Ironically, though, Minolta was sued uh, and lost, um, I think it was to Honeywell, a $129 million court case in the 90s um, for some technology that Honeywell was claiming uh, that, that Minolta took from him. But anyway, so this is uh, the Nifty 50. It's an f1.7. It's a six-element lens. It's nice, sharp lens, again, with great bokeh. And you can see it right in the, uh, right in the viewfinder. It's a fairly close focusing lens too. I am at, uh, I don't know, probably about eight or 10 inches, something like that. It says 0.45 meters, so you can do the math on that. It does have a depth of field scale built into it, which is good. Um, it's a great little portrait lens, and it's uh, same as the rest of them. It's very quick to autofocus, and you see the autofocus light going off there. But one thing you'll notice is the front element probably because it's not a zoom the front element doesn't rotate when you're when you autofocus it and it also has uh, a lens hood built in but yeah so you have a nice little lens hood and it gets the job done just enough to keep the flare off the side because you can see that front element is pretty far back in there as it is so that little extra you get from the lens hood uh, gets the job done you don't need a, a really big obtrusive uh, lens hood all right so uh, and I'll show you some samples that, that I took with this lens I do like this lens a lot um, but it's, uh, you know, and, and a 50 should be part of everybody's kit. It's good for low light. It's a 1.7. It's a nice sharp lens and, and it autofocuses just as well as the other ones do. All right. So, but let me tell you what the overall overriding, uh, benefit is of this camera. More than anything, the biggest deal about this camera isn't the autofocusing, isn't the automatic film advance, isn't the lenses, 
uh, isn't a great viewfinder. It's not, you know, all the cool automation and all the cool cards that uh, Minolta came up with to, to fit in here. It is the price. Guys, if you want to get a dirt cheap system, let's go over the numbers a little bit. The Minolta Maxim body, okay, just as it was with the with the chip in here and fully functioning, everything's working 100%, but it is a little bit damaged, 29 bucks. Okay, 29 bucks. Uh, this lens, this nifty 50 six element um, Minolta lens, and it's a real deal, good lens, coated, sharp, you know, the whole nine, uh, $39. The beer can, this beautiful metal barrel, 70 to 210, constant aperture, F4, zoom, was $20. 20 bucks, okay? And there was, there was some for a little bit more, but I don't think they got above like $30. If you look at this lens, you got a metal lens mount, it's got super fast auto focusing, and it'll fit on your Sony cameras. This would be a nice lens to have on your digital camera if you've got one. This 35 to 70 constant aperture zoom, again, uh, it, given the plastic element and the whole thing, great results from this lens, beautiful pictures, nice and sharp, and you've got macro capability, $15. $15, bucks, guys, come on. Metal lens mount, right? The nifty 50 that I'm showing you here, is a great sharp fast lens it's great for uh, low light situations uh, it's got the the built-in lens hood it's got a nice coated lens it's, i mean just beautiful glass in there you can see it and you do get great pictures from it let's not forget the flash um and this is you know one of their better ones this flash was 20 bucks free shipping 20 bucks that that was it so if you look at it you've got a, a semi-pro camera body three lens kit uh oh and then the uh the the card as well i did i did go ahead and buy the card a lot of these cameras you're going to find they already have the card um so if we do the math what a little bit of trivia the the maxim the two x's in maxim when the when they originally came out with the maxim cameras they intersected the two X's, kind of like Exxon, have, you know, they do in their logo. And Exxon actually sued them and won uh, to, to get them to stop doing that. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't want anybody else crossing their X's but Exxon for some reason, even though they're not, they're not selling to, you know, they're not a competitor. They don't compete with each other. So take that for what it's worth. Okay, guys, so thanks for tuning in. This is the Minolta. Maxim or Dynax 7000i. Go get one.